Welcome to Comics Bazaar, the channel of comics commentary and arcana. This video features the Uncanny X-Men number 185, cover dated September 1984. So the cover here by John Romita Jr. inked by Dan Green featuring Rogue looking very menacing standing over the unconscious form of Storm. And we have the cover caption Rogue Public Enemy. This is a very striking cover very visually attractive and um, energetic, dynamic, but it's a little bit of a misdirect. We do get a scene like this, but not quite what uh, we're seeing here in relation to that cover caption. So let's open this one up to the splash page. And we have here, well, it's the story title as well, Public Enemy. And the opening scene is at the Pentagon, Washington DC. We've got Henry Peter Gyrick there giving an address to, regarding Rogue, where he says she's a mutant and as dangerous as she is powerful, she's our target, okay. So the creative team here, Chris Claremont Ryder, John Romita Jr. and Dan Green credited as artists. As I've said before, John Romita Jr. providing breakdowns, Dan Green finishes in ink. Tom Orzakowski, letterer, Glynis Wine, colorist, and Anne Nocenti is the editor. So let's continue with this. We have Gyrick here at a podium and he is giving the assembled ladies and gentlemen a lowdown on Rogue. And there are events here being uh, referred to that uh, were told in Uncanny X-Men 158. So we've got Ramita Jr.'s version of uh, those episodes from 158. We've got Henry Peter Gyrick here at the podium in his double-breasted suit and a screen tone supplied by Dan Green. It's pretty good looking. And it's all zooming in on this. It's the neutralizer for superpowers that Forge created in the previous issue, 184. And it's now in the hands of Gyrick. And he says, one good shot will essentially transform Rogue into a normal human being. But he's interrupted by Raven Darkholm, who is the disguised alter ego of Mystique, leader of the Brotherhood of Evil Mutants. And she says that she wants Forge's neutralizer. Val Cooper's there at the address as well. And Val basically says that it is an ideal opportunity to learn what the effects of the gun will have. Of course, Val doesn't know of Raven's um, alter ego as Mystique. And Mystique, of course, has a uh, maternal not a biological, but um, a feeling-based maternal relationship to Rogue, whom she raised. So Raven is shocked that it was Val's idea. And Val says, uh, Rogue's a killer. And she thinks that on the basis of events in issue 182, when it seemed that Rogue had killed a S.H.I.E.L.D. agent, but in fact, um, that was all um, an attempt to frame Michael Rossi for that killing and then Rogue has gotten the blame. So that's incorrect. And uh, Val continues and says, we'd no longer have to live in terror of supervillains. One zap and their powers are gone, the threat removed. So Raven says she'll protest. And this is interesting, waste of time, says Val, this policy decision came from the Oval Office. Like it or not, Raven, you'll just have to live with it. So the implication is that the president has approved of this. And there's a little, um, there will be an irony here if you look at issue 201, uh, drawn by Rick Leonardi, where Rogue flies up uh, and uh, plants a kiss on the window of Air Force One, and the president is inside, Ronald Reagan at the time. So a little um, kind of retrospective irony in terms of what's about to happen later in this issue, and the president signing off on an order to use the neutralizer on Rogue. So let's see. Uh, then we have a scene switch to the X Mansion. And this is interesting because in the previous issue, 184, uh, Rachel uh, made a time jump to 1984 and uh, made contact with the X Men, or rather, Professor X rescued her and uh, some of the X team rescued her from Celine, uh, the uh, uh, ancient uh, vampire. Uh, a power vampire who came from Nova Roma to New York after an adventure of the New Mutants. And this is an interesting little setup here, kind of suggesting Professor X acting in the office of a psychoanalyst with Rachel sitting on the 
uh, reclining on the couch here, and Professor X in his uh, chair listening to her, but they're interrupted, their session is interrupted by a Storm. Interesting outfit that um, uh, John Romita Jr. has given her. It looks pretty good on her. And Storm is giving the news that Rogue is gone. And she went sometime the previous night. She says, nice screen tone here, again from Diane Green, her bed has not been slept in and the closet is empty. She left no note. So she's left the X mansion and Professor X realizes he can't sense Rogue's thoughts, so that places her beyond the New York metropolitan area. So that gives us a sense at this time of the limits on Professor X's telepathic power. Um, and Rogue, or sorry, Storm fills him in on how Rogue has become uh, more disturbed after her recent encounter with Michael Rossi. <clears throat> She's become increasingly tense and unstable. And Storm says, rebuffing all my attempts to help. So interesting little contrast here where Professor X is helping Rachel and he was meant to help Rogue when she joined the X-Men back in issue 180, sorry, 171. Um, but clearly hasn't been able to do too much for her or with her and is unaware um, of her recent distress. So um, Rossi's um, on a mission, so uh, Storm hasn't been able to get an explanation from him. She says here, Rogue turned to the X-Men because her powers were driving her insane. She thought, we thought she was getting better. It's not just the X-Men she turned to, she turned to Professor X um, specifically, and he hasn't been able to help is the implication. Storm continues, but now I'm desperately af afraid she may be suffering a relapse. So the professor says they'll go to the lab and they'll use Cerebro to try and find her. Cerebro, of course, boosts his telepathic powers. This is a great page and a great little design um, idea of Ramita Jr.'s here to use the uh, phone cord from the landline as a, um, a panel border here. And we have Rachel in the professor's absence going to his um, phone book, finding a number for Scott Summers and ringing it. And the number is, uh, it's a landline in Alaska. So she's confused because her memories are, as it increasingly turns out, of a different past than the one that she has um, time jumped to. So she thinks to herself, I'm making a mistake, I shouldn't call, but to hear his voice again, to know he's alive and that some things can't change no matter what. So Scott answers the phone um, and asks, is there anyone there? But Rachel says nothing. Madeline asks him what's up and he says, no answer, probably a crank or a wrong number. And he hangs up and Rachel here is just left distraught. And I love the idea of Ramita Juniors where when Scott hangs up, we've just got a blank open panel here. That's a really nice idea, some great storytelling. Um, by Ramita Jr. And he's got more time to think about things like that as he's doing breakdowns and leaving the finishing to Dan Green. So Rachel here reveals that for her, Scott Summers is her dad. And interesting too, that when she hears Madeline's voice in the background, she thinks of her as her mother, which implies that Madeline's voice sounds similar to, at least over the phone, Jean Grey's. Um, and that will um, factor into what's revealed ultimately about Madeline Pryor, even though it wasn't uh, Claremont's intention at this point, but he's suggesting something there with the similarities and parallels nonetheless. So then we're back at the Pentagon and Raven is um, going down to a sub-level, which appears to be the quarters of the Brotherhood of Evil Mutants. So somehow or other, she has been able to in, well, via her um, appearance as Raven Darkholm, she's been able to infiltrate um, uh, the Pentagon as leader of the Brotherhood of Evil Mutants, and they're living underneath at a sub, like a sublevel of the Pentagon. And there's kind of an implication there that how could she do that? How could the Blob and Pyro and others be getting in and out of the Pentagon, especially the Blob, um, be getting in and out of the Pentagon unless there's somebody in there that's facilitating it? Um, that's at least what I think on the basis of this. So then she finds um, um, Irene Adler there that is uh, Destiny. She wasn't expecting her and Destiny has um, uh, news for her on the basis of her precognitive abilities that Rogue is in grave danger. 
Quite a large drinks cabinet there Mystique is keeping in, um, in the apartment underground. Interesting that. So um, Mystique says Val Cooper and Henry Gyrick want to make an example of her to provide, to prove the government rather can handle super criminals without the aid of heroes like the Avengers. Forge's neutralizer may give them the means to do that. So uh, Destiny asks her, what are your intentions? Um, Mystique isn't really sure. She says, Rogue's powers are the cause of all her misery. Might she not be better off without them? She could live a normal life. She'd have her chance at happiness. And Irene responds, and of course, be free to return home to you. Is that so bad? Says Mystique. I love her as my own daughter. Her place is with me. This is my opportunity to help, in a way, Xavier can't. But um, uh, Destiny responds, have you the right to make such a decision without Rogue's knowledge or consent? She's a grown woman, well able to take responsibility for her own life. The choice must be hers. So then Mystique asks the obvious question, which is, you can see the future as a precog. Tell me which course of action is best for Rogue. And Destiny's response is interesting here. I wish I could, she says, but these past few days, my perceptions have become jumbled as if the very fabric of time itself has been rent asunder. I'm sorry, Raven. The only advice I can offer is that you follow the dictates of your heart. So that's interesting. Is it a reference to Naze and what he had to say to Forge in the previous issue about um, a similar disruption in the fabric of reality? Or is it a reference to um, Rachel's time jump to 1984, uh, which is which would be might be a reason for jumbling um, Destiny's perceptions um, as the very fabric of time has been rent asunder by Rachel's arrival? It's one or the other or both. And then the scene switches to a military transport plane outbound from Washington's Andrews Air Force Base, and aboard it is Henry Peter Gyrick and Val Cooper. And uh, they are uh, using a, a tracker device, which was whipped up by the by uh, the Beast actually in Avengers Annual Number Ten, to track Rogue's physiology, which is a synthesis of human and alien after she had permanently absorbed the powers of Captain Marvel. Um, so they're after Rogue and they're en route. And then the scene switches mid-page to Dallas, Texas, Eagle Plaza, and an upset Forge who's taking a, um, a holographic video call from Mystique in her guise as Raven, um, dark home. Forge doesn't know her um, true identity. He's upset that the, at the fact of the neutralizer having been taken and that it's going to be used on Rogue. He's worried about its effects because it's never been tested on a human subject before. It might even kill, he says. So Raven or Mystique has done this in order to um, put Forge into play. So Forge gets aboard this uh, private jet and um, makes his way um, um, up in the air and making a call to the president. So he's got a direct line to the president. And if he's unhappy, with the answer he gets, he says the government can find itself another inventor. So then the scene switches to Caldecott County on the banks of the Mississippi. And we got a nice um, evocative uh, uh, narrative captions here describing the location. And this was a strength of Claremont's. You see him do it a lot in this era. This is farming country where once cotton was king and stately mansions lined the river setting a standard for style and affluent, gracious living that was the envy of the world. It was a way of life people believed would last forever, but the king has long since been dethroned and most of the great estates fallen into ruin. Of all that once was, only the river remains. And then we've got this great page of um, rogue swinging from a vine or a rope and um, diving into the Mississippi. And then um, there's a tugboat here, and we've got the uh, various shouts of appreciation from, well, the main male members aboard. Uh, beautiful, encore, encore, stop the boat, I want to get off. And some guy giving his uh, number to her, and a, dog, and a wolf whistle there as well. So Rogue appreciates that. You all really know how to do a girl's heart proud. And then she lays back on her uh, beach towel on the riverbank, and she soaks up the uh, delicious, wickedly lazy afternoon and sun, and thinks to herself, 
and there's just a hint of a breeze to keep her body from getting too hot. And she thinks she should have done this ages ago. She's been away far too long. It's so peaceful hereabouts, but then it always was. So a place that she's familiar with personally, no hassles, no fears, if only it did last. And then we've got the shadow cast over and a nice use of screen tone as well. Great panels on this page, great storytelling. And who is it? It's Storm. Storm has tracked her down. So obviously the professor had su success using Cerebro to track Rogue. And so Storm has gone after to uh, find her by the Mississippi, the banks of the Mississippi. Great two pages here. Great kind of quiet moment, heart to heart between Rogue and Storm. And I love the way that Ramita Jr. draws this in terms of the body language, how they're at ease here at the beginning of the two page sequence. And by the end, um, they're up on their feet because um, some tension has crept in. So um, Rogue explains here also um, a part of her origin story, uh, the first manifestation of her powers when she was um, a young teenager. She said she'd hide out here when she was a kid and the world got too tough and she'd watch the boats go by and imagine she was Mark Twain piling, piloting them um, up to uh, Natchez uh, and St. Louis or said to New Orleans, this tree and me have been through a lot of good times and bad. That's the one that she swung off. So maybe that rope was one that she put there as a child, but also she gets to the trauma of her childhood. If that's the positive of her childhood, here comes the trauma. Me and Cody Robbins were fooling around, necking really, wasn't anything serious. We just wanted to see what all the fuss was about. I kissed him and he killed over. I thought I'd killed him. Then I thought I was going crazy. He heard, I, I heard voices in my head, saw memories. I knew weren't mine, they were Cody's. I tried to shut him out, but I couldn't. So I ran and ran and ran. And after a while, the voices went away and I was myself again. And she concludes that she guesses she's been running ever since. But Storm makes the point, look, you know, you're no longer alone. Uh, you need no longer fear who and what you are. But Rogue says, come on, I've been at Xavier's school for months and nothing's changed. So really getting that point hammered home in this issue. Still can't control my powers. Heck, I'm worse off than before because now I don't know anymore where my loyalties lie with Yol or Mystique. So Storm makes the point, we're your friends, Rogue. Is there nothing we can do? So that makes Rogue laugh because she remembers back in issue 171 that Storm was ready to quit rather than um, allow Rogue or tolerate Rogue joining the team. And then they got on the point of Carol Danvers because the reason is, uh, the reason was Carol was a friend um, of Storm's and um, that's what made her react in that way. And then she says, I know your sense of honor and decency is stronger than you care to admit, but Rogue isn't listening to that. She says, because of what I did, I've got to spend the rest of my life as two people, Danvers and me. I'll never be myself. I'll never have any thoughts or feelings that are purely my own. She continues, decency's got nothing to do with, it, with how I feel. The cruelest sadist in creation couldn't have taught up a worse punishment. Um, well, it's uh, Claremont's punishment, yes, in a, in a manner of speaking. Is it any wonder, wonder I'm so full of anger and hate? Got to admit it though, uh, it sure fits the crime. So, uh, Storm asks her, do you trust no one? Why do you lash out? Do you trust no one? And she says, how can she when the slightest physical contact might destroy someone? And then Storm asks an interesting question. Rogue, has every exercise of your power been an act of violence? Has no one ever given himself of his own free will? So that's what gets Rogue off the ground. Don't be stupid. It's a kind of living death. Nobody wants that even for a moment. No, that ain't quite true. There was Wolverine last year in Tokyo to save my life. He let me absorb his healing powers. That's issue 170, or sorry, uh, yeah, 173. So Storm reaches her hand out towards Rogue. Would you like to see the world through my eyes? And this is interesting. This is the way, like this is part of what was so great about Claremont's run and his work on the characters that he really thinks through um, moments like this, um, like this is this is not plot based. This is deriving from character. This is the kind of thing that Storm might offer to do. So she removes her glove and says she's prepared to take the risk. So Rogue takes her hand nonetheless, 
and she conks out she goes unconscious as was expected and rogue gently drops catches her and drops her to the um uh, drops her to rest on the ground and then the powers kick in storm's powers kick in that's a great panel there and lighting by ramita jr and dan green and she speaks in um exclaims in aroro's own terms goddess i never imagined the world could be so beautiful and then we have her experience of storm's powers the sun and the air and the water i see them as patterns of energy resonating within my own being and that's so interesting because she was enjoying it passively lying on the riverbank and now she can see how it works uh, resonating within her own being it's like even better than the enjoyment she was having of nature a few pages ago i feel aware of every living thing around me and then she realizes her voice is changing becoming a blend of mine and aurora's i still have my accent but the tone is deeper and my speech more formal like hers this is very weird but very neat and then she tries to um channel those powers and play around with them which she does here and uh, that's a pretty cool sequence as well where she creates a little rainstorm and um she thinks here i feel full of such excitement and joy nothing seems beyond me and because aurora did not resist the transfer her memories have yet to cause me trouble perhaps they never will that's an interesting point and she thinks i only want a little more what harm is there in that but she uh, pulls her hand away and she's disgusted with herself how could i even think such a thing roro is my friend this is how i repair her trust but she's shot in the back zap and we have a voice off panel federal officers rogue we have a warrant for your arrest so she's confused um her powers are uh, diminished roro is still unconscious on the riverbank she tries to fly away she gets caught in the branches of a tree and she sees the posse coming from her for her uh, heading her way there's gyrick out front she's trying to use her powers here her abilities seem uh, the most affected uh, because storms ascend um, psyche's uh, gaining ascendancy she finds herself thinking in her terms reacting as she would and then gyrick shoots after again we've got val cooper there uh, but she dodges those blasts she needs all her speed and agility to dodge um the blasts so then she throws the uh the jeeps at gyrick and uh the fbi officers and secret service officers and then unfortunately nearby using storm's powers the tugboat gets in trouble um so the captain says five minutes ago the sky was clear and now we're in the middle of a full-fledged hurricane so he calls a mayday tug longshot annie declaring an emergency that's interesting the name of the tugboat longshot annie because i wonder if the, at this point there'd been some very early conversations between anna senti as editor and chris claremont regarding her idea for the upcoming longshot miniseries maybe a little in joke there from claremont so um uh rogue here uh realizing this is a real storm and wondering whether she's the cause is it a reflection of her rage with the feds and um she wonders um about storm whether her every emotion is echoed by the weather around her and that's an idea that claremont plays with um quite a bit in his original run and she thinks for all i care the feds can drown serve them right that siren the tug i saw earlier she must be in trouble so roe goes to rescue um the tugboat and uh the men aboard but she begins to lose her control over the weather and panics here my mind's a blank aurora special perceptions are gone I'm trying to make the elements obey my will but nothing's happening and i love what ramita junior does here with the panel layouts where as rogues panic rises the panels begin to squeeze right in on her and we get this close up on her uh panicked the panicked look of her eyes really well done but then storm arrives conscious again and to the rescue and um takes control of the storm the tugboat's out of danger um for the moment and uh storm says my awareness began to return when you were last on the beach i felt the lightning strike and so rogue thinks that means the thoughts i had about the tug's crew weren't hers at all but my own so she's getting some insight into the fact that 
you know, she is not the villain that she sometimes blames herself um, for being. And Storm has even brought her a tunic, which she puts on. The tug is foundering, though, so they got to tow it ashore, which they do. And they're doing it here. This is really well drawn by Romita Jr. and Dan Green. And just at that point, Rogue is um, telling Aurora about the weapon they have that cancels out superpowers. And she says, and look, they're bringing reinforcements. But this is the arrival of Forge on his super jet. And Aurora says, I know of the neutralizer Rogue. Mystique told me when she told me where to find you. And there's little asterisks here. And I know from Amasanti, for that story, see future issues of Marvel Fanfare. Actually, issue 40, which was published years later, I have that. So if you want, let me know in the comments if you want me to do a review of that encounter between Storm and uh, Mystique, uh, which took place you know, off panel in respect of uh, this comic, but I can review that issue if you'd like. And then, um, Gyrick realizes, actually it's, uh, I think it's Val here, realizes it's Forge's private jet. So Gyrick thinks Forge has come to back them up and he decides here that he's going to calibrate the neutralizer on full power. So he was only using half power or less up to this point. And then Forge out of the jet, jumps at Gyrick, throws off his aim and Gyrick who was aiming for Rogue hits Storm just as Storm intervenes to push Rogue out of the way. And this is a great panel here where Tom Orzakowski is contributing with the ARG here um, and Storm superimposed over the um, shout and just the energy that is pouring out of her as well. Just really powerful panel and page because the tugboat um, is destroyed um, also. Uh, by the outpouring of energy from Storm. Everybody diving overboard. Rogue falling into the Mississippi. And Forge goes out after Storm. He thinks, there's Storm, but I can't see any sign of the other one, Rogue. She fell in mid-channel. The current must have swept her away. Well, we'll catch up with her in the next issue. So Storm, Forge thinks, caught the full brunt. Or sorry, she caught the full brunt of Storm's power discharge. And the secondary explosion of the tug's fuel tanks... If she survives, it'll be a miracle. So then Forge pulls Storm out of the water and Gyrick off offers him his hand, but uh, Forge angrily smacks it away and says, I hope you're feeling proud, mister. You just shot the wrong woman. And Gyrick says she was aiding and abetting a fugitive, but Forge makes the point. They were trying to save lives. They could have escaped, but they didn't. Whatever Rogue did, she and especially Storm are supposedly innocent until proven guilty. That's the law, Gyrick. Only for Storm, a trial superfluous, thanks to you. She's already condemned. You stripped her of her powers. You destroyed her. So Forge looking really angry there. And a really good point, you know, um, that, you know, if, if Rogue had been arrested, um, she, she sh should have stood trial or she could expect to stand trial. Innocence until proven guilty, etc., etc. So there's interesting kind of legal and moral questions raised by um, the interaction here between Gyrick and Forge. And then we're on the last page. And this is a setup for the next issue where our point of view changes. Why are they on fire here? Um, Forge is saying outlaws they may be, the X-Men, <clears throat> in the eyes of the government, but the X-Men have always fought for humanity. Your stupidity has changed that. You may single-handedly have turned them from our defenders to our deadliest enemies. And whose vantage point are we seeing this from? The vantage point of the Dire Reads. They're looking into one of their scrying pools and they see the neutralizer in Gyrick's hand. That mechanism is a primitive analog to the neutralizer used by our most dread foe, the Galadorian Silver Space Knight, Rom. As yet, its power cannot harm us, but it derived from similar principles given time its creator Forge here will inevitably involve it into a Turan version of that accursed Galadorian weapon. So, skip to this point for us, for, for it would mean our defeat and doom, therefore Forge must die. So next, Life Death by Chris Claremont, Barry Windsor Smith and Terry Austin. And so we're going to get a continuation of uh, the story of Forge and Storm 
and the uh, beginnings of a budding romance between the pair, as well as, well as um, a follow-up to What Became of Rogue and these dire reads and uh, their um, invasion um, of Earth and their targeting of uh, a Forge. Letters page here, answered by Madeline Pryor. Letters concern uh, the honeymoon between her and Scott in 176. Um, so there you go. I do hope that you enjoyed this review and commentary on Uncanny X-Men 185. If you did, please like the video on YouTube. If you haven't done so already, subscribe to the channel and stay tuned for more content like this.